<laughs> All right, well, on Hugh's suggestion, um, there's a lot of familiar faces here, but uh, let's go around and just introduce ourselves rather quickly. Uh, I'm Pastor Aaron. I'm the associate pastor here at Trinity Lutheran in Wapaka. So, yeah. Anita, would you like to go next? I'm afraid, Anita, Anita. I grew up in South Dakota, um, overlooking the Missouri River, and on the other side was the Sioux Indian Reservation. So I've always cared and been interested in indigenous tribes. Okay. Kinsey, so would you like to go next? Oh, Fred Kinsey. Uh, we spent a couple of years in a LAMP program, uh, mm -hmm. holding a summer Bible school up in uh, the northern reaches of Canada. Were you a pilot? Were you, were you a pilot? No, no we, we were. were just, we taught Bible school. Um, I'm Charlene Kinsey, and other than the lay program, I also went to Church of the Wilderness. That time we went the bus, and it's just an interesting thing. Okay. Wonderful. Uh, Pastor Grant? Yeah, I'm Pastor Grant. Uh, I'm the DEM for the Synod, and um, uh, I'd been engaged at least somewhat since um, growing up in Wisconsin, uh, but what really turned the corner for me in, in wanting to understand more and, and do better by our Native brothers and sisters um, was when I was actually serving in Namibia, and I saw um, there how, how different tribal groups pushed against each other, and I thought, oh, how could they do that? And I thought, well, we do that too. And <laughs> So then that became a very different conversation for me. Can you tell everybody what DMA says, stands for? For DEM, it's the Director for Evangelical Mission. Uh, okay. I wear a number of hats. I'm um, mainly focused on evangelism and church vitality for the Synod. Okay, I know Lutherans have a lot of alphabet soup, so. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, Pete, would you like to go next? Sure. Um, I'm Pete Gasper and um, I was on that bus to the Church of the Wilderness. Um, I, my parents were foster parents and we had a Oneida a brother when I was growing up. So, but I'm, I'm just interested in, in this, this study. Awesome. Nancy? I'm Nancy Shanky. I'm, I'm married to Pete, Pastor Grant, just for you. Pete's gonna be dropping the book off to you tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Mm -hmm. I've just had an interest in uh, this for a long time, and I know that a lot of members of our congregation are interested as well, and I'm sure there'll be others that hopefully will be able to join us for future sessions. And in addition to this, by working on this project, we're hoping to be able to expand to more people within our Senate and have some real action take place. Yeah. Uh, Matt, masquerading as Alicia, if you're able to unmute. <laughs> There we go. So Matt, we can hear you, I think, because you're unmuted. Oh. Maybe not. I can hear them talking, but only through, I'll be right back. Okay. So while uh, pastor's gone, I'll just introduce myself a little bit. So um, again, I'm Hugh Cress, as it says on the screen. Um, to do two, my career has been education. I was a, um, Lutheran teacher, Lutheran principal um, for all those years. And then also our school oftentimes supported the LAMP program. I remember that, seeing the little, little logo with the plane on it and those kinds yeah. of things too, and seeing the, the videos and the photographs to do too. So, so we have kind of a connection there, you know, in terms of that. Um, See, so Pastor, are, there, are you ready to have an introduction from your end there in the multi purpose room? Can you hear me better now? Oh, yeah, perfectly. <laughs> All right. Um, I'm Matt Lick. Uh, I went on that bus oh, oh. up there in a bowl or two and uh, uh, really enjoyed it. Um, my, uh, in the past, um, I guess, I, I, early on in my, in my faith walk, I, I was following more of a Native American belief. But as I learned more about it, I, I've learned that it was actually the wrong belief. And, and I was a little confused, but I'm still... Um, very much in tune with with the Native American population, and uh, I'm very interested in learning everything I can about it. Okay. All right. And Pastor, I was starting to introduce myself a little bit 
Yeah, um, go for it. And so I don't want to take too much time talking about myself, but people can maybe understand where I'm coming from uh, to do this too. So it, it all started for me when there was a Senate convention um, and I was getting a little bored at some of the sessions. And so you do the wandering thing where you go out and look at the different booths and there was a gentleman sitting there and said, Lutheran Church of the Wilderness. And I, I looked at him and I thought, hmm, this is not a typical, you know, Swedish or Norwegian Lutheran, you know, you know in terms of this. And so it turned out it was a representative from Lutheran Church of the Wilderness. So we had a conversation and um, I started getting interested in that. And then uh, as the Lord works in mysterious ways, um, I got a, an award from the state of Wisconsin for my teaching with a grant of $5,000 to do whatever I wanted with, with it. And so I thought, hmm, well, one of the things is I'm having these, my class, which was in Appleton at the time, uh, we knew nothing about, we were studying, you know, you get to the history part in your book and it talks about Native Americans. I said, what better thing to do? Because I'm an experiential learner rather than just read something, let's experience it. I said, why don't we contact Lutheran Church of Wilderness and see about learning about them? Because nobody in the congregation knew about them. I didn't know about them. And of course, the kids didn't know about them. So we spent the better part of a couple of months taking field trips. The money was used to pay for a bus to go up there and to pay for very, very, very crude technology. Because this is like in the 80s, late 80s, you know, to do that too. And the kids wrote a book. And... Uh, they wrote a book and they did all the graphics from it and that might be something at later time that somebody might be interested in seeing the kids book uh, i have a powerpoint about it to do too and they did by being experiencing it because that was pastor schreiner at the time that was there and he he took the kids and did a lot of different things with them he played monopoly football with them and um, he took them into the church and had them look around and find out there was tobacco in there explained that and then they, the biggest thing they did was they interviewed their elders, which I'm one of that generation now, and a lot of us are. And they found, got the stories, and they, they wrote a book about the history according to the elders uh, to do it too. And we gave that book back to the tribe and so on. And the, the biggest thing I thought from that, from that was these kids came back with a desire to interview and talk to their own elders talk to their grandma and grandpa, I talk to their aunts and that kind of stuff and find out their family stories. And so from that, it morphed into kind of a genealogy unit for the kids. And they wrote their own family histories at that point, you know, to do it too. So that was how this all got started. Um, so after that, then um, we did some more things and I did have a tour up to the, to the, um, with the Church of the Wilderness a little bit later with adults. And then I moved away. And I moved away um, from Appleton back to my original school where I was first a teacher to become a principal in Andrew Forest, Illinois, to do there too. And then through another Senate God working thing too, I got connected with the Navajo Nation and a mission there because I was doing a special project, which I'll go into, and found out a lot about the Navajo people and their tribe and their history and those kind of things and how fun you didn't want to talk about certain European explorers like or even American explorers like Kit Carson is not a favorite of the Navajo you know in terms of it and find out about their stories so came back with this whole thing like well it's not just you know not just a Stockbridge Muncie it's not just the Cherokee it's it's the Navajo it's you know, the Apaches, it's the Sioux, they all seem to have a kind of a common history, you know, to do that. And so I just was more interested in that, in that common history. So that kind of came about to where we are now. And I thought, boy, you know, Trinity has a uh, initial relationship with the Church of the Wilderness. Like you said, some of you have been up there on that tour guide. And I took another group from Bethany, where I live at Bethany, uh, up there about a year and a half ago to do too. So um, just thought, what better way for us to find out about something called the Doctrine of Discovery, which again, I knew nothing about. The, mo the older I get, the more I find out I know nothing, the little the less I know <laughs> about things. And so I didn't have any idea what that was. And so in 2016, we'll get into that a little bit later, you know, the ELCA got involved with that. 
to do too. And that's where Pastor Grant will come in in a later presentation saying, what is this doctrine of discovery and what's the ELCA doing about it? So, and again, I didn't want people he hearing me talk all the time or it just had to be a history lesson. So we're going to have different, different people on. So, so that's who I am. I'm just kind of a, I'm not that necessarily a good speaker. Um, but I'm a really good facilitator. I have found out over the years that I can, I can create things and facilitate things like this to do too. So, so that's who I am. Awesome. Thanks. So, so Pastor, I'm back to you then. Yeah. Uh, so that we could open our time together with a prayer. So the Lord be with you. And also with you. Loving God, we thank you for today, for the, the promise of spring that the rain and thunderstorms and the wind hold within them. Uh, we thank you for this chance to come together and to learn um, more about our history and the history of our siblings in Christ. We ask that your spirit of wisdom be with us uh, these weeks as we study and learn together, as we listen and hear stories um, and learn together. We love you and we pray all of this in Jesus name. Amen. Oh, Amen. Well, thank you. I guess it's back to me. Yes. And I'm going to, I have a PowerPoint I put together, and I always want to have a short PowerPoint um, to do too, because I think there's nothing more boring than watching a long PowerPoint, you know, of things to do too. But um, in the PowerPoint, one of the things I will try to do is to say, where are we going? Why are we doing this? I'm always like, where are you, st where are you going to head and how are you going to get there? You know, kind of a person to do too. So, well, here's where the technology hopefully works because I'm gonna share a screen with you. And it should be this. Can everybody see that? Yes. Okay. All right. So a slideshow from the beginning. Okay, so this is, I wanna thank Pastor Aaron for putting this graphic together. It's a wonderful graphic that, um, uh, and the title is also so she's again i'm not a very linguistic person so i have a hard time putting things into as my wife said when i write something she said you know you just wrote a whole paragraph and you could probably say that in one sentence you know in terms of that so uh keying on this idea of reflections uh it's just a reflection we're going to it's kind of like you're looking in a mirror and you look in the mirror and um oftentimes use the example if you look in the mirror in the morning and you go oh this is gonna be a good day, you know, because you look in the mirror and I like what I see and that kind of stuff. And then you look at the mirror another day and go, bad hair day, you know, I don't realize, you know, what's going on here. I gotta kind of take time. But building relationships with our Native American siblings. Um, I like that word sibling to do too. It means our brothers and sisters um, to do too. And of course we have this wonderful opportunity to build um, it with the uh, Stockbridge Muncie. You know, you know, people which have a tremendous history, you know, you know, in terms of, of you know, I didn't, re didn't realize that they were some of the people that first met Henry Hudson when he got off the boat, you know, in terms of that. And now here they are today, you know, just boulders just a few miles away from us. And they have this wonderful heritage of that. Not necessarily always being Lutheran, no. Uh, we Christians have a way of uh, dividing ourselves into denominations. And so they have been Presbyterian and, and whatever other East Anglican, I guess, at some point to do it too, but kind of staying with Christianity, which is kind of amazing. So thank you again, Pastor, for that. Okay, I call this coming attractions. Um, hopefully this um, video will be something that we can share again with people who can say, oh, what is going on with this session? Why are we doing this? So after it's recording, we'll be able to click on that and you can say, oh, you know, whether it be a friend or a relative or something like that, because I'm going to share this with my my brothers. Um, I have one in Oklahoma that um, has interesting perspective on Native Americans in Oklahoma, because in the, in Oklahoma, all the mineral rights belong to Native Americans. And uh, so my brother who's in was in the oil business has an interesting perspective on that. I'll just put it that way. And then my older brother lives in Montana you know, in terms of it, and uh, has a lot of, we're near Yellowstone Park and that kind of stuff, and a lot of Native American things there with the buffalo and so on. So I'm going to, hopefully you'll share this and kind of spread the word. Uh, I look at this as being kind of a pilot today. Um, 
we'll learn what works and what doesn't work. Because at the end, I'm going to ask you, what was good about this session? Or what do you want to do in the future? Because I have not written the second section yet. You know, to do it. I know, I know generally what it's about, but I can get really, really detailed into the history, or I can just kind of do a kind of a general kind of thing. How much do you like videos? All those kind of things. So, so that's coming attractions. Okay, so you can share the word. There's going to be seven sessions. There's really an ace, but I'll explain that in a minute. Um, both virtual and person. They'll always start at 11 o'clock here, and Pastor Aaron will be the facilitator for this. I think I put operator, you'll see later for that. She's a, she's a tech person, so if anything doesn't work, we can blame her, not me. To do. But I'm at home, and I can do this from home, which is a wonderful thing to do. Uh, my son from Chicago is here, and he's a physical therapist, and he spent two hours in the same spot yesterday attending a, a national conference for physical therapists. So it's wonderful we can do this. I'll be in a more comfortable place, get a cup of coffee. If somebody gets up and you know, it needs to use a facility or have a cup of coffee or whatever, that's fine. Um, we're starting out having only the main audience being members of Trinity Lutheran Church of the Wilderness. Um, and the idea there was, of course, our ultimate goal is, is to develop a closer relationship between the two congregations. So they should be the, the ones that are the core of this. The, as Pastor Grant would say, evangelism is, is, is a bigger thing than just us. And we need to reach out to people uh, and help them develop relationships too. So, so that's why Pastor Grant's here too, because the ELCA sent leadership. He's representing them, and Nancy is also representing that kind of because she is the vice president of our synod, you know, in terms of that too. So we've got some powerhouse figures here. Um, there will be historical presentations because I think that's one of the things I want people to understand. Um, my one of my minors in, in my undergraduate was history too, too and America, especially American history. And it's really an interesting, history is always interestingly told by who's telling it. You know, is it being told by uh, the explorers or is it being told by Native Americans? Is it being told by people who are in Washington DC or, or, or whatever? Um, and we'll do interviews because we're gonna have some people from uh, we're from Church of the Wilderness and from the Nominee Nation, uh, also here, and from just the Stockbridge Muncie people themselves. And you'll have a chance to ask questions you know, about that. And there'll be testimonials, which I think is really important. As, as the kids find out, the testimonials are really, really important just to hear the stories of, of people you know, to do it too. And then this is where we hope the eighth session, hopefully COVID is taking a dive and will stay down. And then we can have a session on May 15th up there at the Church of the Wilderness and you know do our Lutheran thing, whatever potluck or whatever we do, that kind of stuff. But just develop maybe a relationship where people can walk away from that. Hey, I've you know I met a couple of people here, like a you know, maybe invite or maybe people of the Trinity want to do some things to sell that too. So this will be like a catalyst do too. So it's interesting, you'll see I put Trinity's logo up there, but Lutheran Church of the Wilderness does not have a logo. Uh, they use many trails, uh, which I won't get into describing. It's a wonderful symbol, you know, uh, of, the, of their church and of their people, you know, to do it too. So stop me at any time, raise your hand, say stop, or I can't hear you or whatever. Okay, here are the sessions. Today it's about introductions. And what are the goals for doing this? And I hope they'll say it over and over again the goals of this. Um, so we're going to be talking about the history of Native Americans in our country, basically our hemisphere, uh, and our state, because we're going to get into um, a little bit about some about Wisconsin, because Trinity Lutheran Church sits on Menominee lands, uh, which I didn't know until I started talking about some of the history of that. So it's not the Danish people that you know, are the founders of that. It, it, it is the, the Menominees who have their encampments here on the Wapaka River and uh, all that kind of stuff in the Crystal River. So we'll be talking with, about our own state and our own church. Um, and then next week, which I'll you all have more about, I just want to have more detailed into the European explorers, the settlers and Native Americans based on the Doctrine of Discovery. So I will introduce the Doctrine of Discovery today um, in a little more detail, 
and how that became the driving force, the whole thing that people took as an attitude of entitlement uh, for, for our explorers, our forefathers, you know, and who came to our here. The 20th will be uh, Greg Miller, who's the president of the Woodland Church of Wilderness. And they're just gonna talk about their whole people. Stockbridge Muncie, it's really the merger of two different tribal groups, which I found out already after talking to, again, I learned from Bud Miller, who we'll see a little bit later, that um, there were quite a few different clans, but the, uh, the ones who are here today are the survival of one clan that survived through all this to do it too. And they have a very, very interesting tight history. Uh, then on the 27th, I'll go back to, back to me, just really go into detail about the expansions of uh, through the Americas uh, and how that impacted all the different tribes and so on, and, and our own people, you know, in terms of that. Uh, because I'm, you know, part of that part of that heritage, you know, I'm basically German. So the Germans came over, you know, and established some things, and the Swedes did things, and the, you know, everybody different different nationality did. Uh, then April 3rd, you won't have to hear from me again because too much because it'll be uh, right now. I, I pretty much have nailed down somebody from a nominee um, tribe that is kind of a renowned speaker. Uh, it speaks all across the country about the nominee history, and he's really, really big into the nominee lands and the waters and their, their heritage and so on. And um, if I have it correct, the Menominees are one of the few tribes that were never moved. You know, they stuck to their place and they've been fiercely uh, guarding that, you might say, you know, in terms of it. So they have a really, really proud history. Uh, then 24th, Grant will be on. And he'll talk all about the Doctrine of Discovery and how the ELCA response has been. That's been going on, if I remember, Pastor Grant, we're into about five years of that, right? Is that correct? Yep, just shake your head, so, you know, go on. And, um, and then May 1st, we'll have Bud Miller and he's going to talk, and that'll be more based on the congregation, uh, with the Church of the Wilderness. And there, hopefully, that's laying the foundation for people saying, wow, I want to find out more about this. So let's, let's have a trip up there, and let's get together and, and uh, celebrate uh, uh, together. So any questions about any of that? Hearing none, move along. Uh, here are the people. Uh, so if you have anything, so if you have any tech problems, um, uh, Pastor Aaron is kind of the operator of that. I'm the, as I said, facilitator. You know, I'm not the leader. I just want to kind of turn the reins over to a lot of people to make sure they have an opportunity to speak. And you'll see up there that there is the, this uh, Stockbridge Muncie band of the Mohegan Nation, and there are four different symbols there. And the many trails is right in the middle. And again, I won't go into that too much, but I think that's something that um, to me, I'm a visual learner, so I look at something like that and say, oh, I can really, really learn from that. Give me a million words now. And then there's the Menominee Nation, their seal. Of course, there's the East Central Center of Wisconsin. And then now the many trails, which is what is used by the um, Lutheran Church of the Wilderness people. So we're going to have Pastor Johnson from... Um, Lutheran Church of the Wilderness, he'll be on, and then we'll have, like you already saw, Greg Miller and Bud Miller on and represent the Stockbridge Nation, uh, Menominee Nation, and then, of course, Grant. So, so you don't have to listen to me a lot. Okay, what's, what's the goal of doing all this? Um, okay, I, as I said, there's a parallel history of Native Americans and European explorers and settlers. It doesn't make any difference whether it's the Dutch settlers, the English settlers, the French settlers, the Spanish settlers. They all came with the same thing in mind, you know, in terms of that. Um, and it became, and I'll get into that more detail, it became a race, a competition, you know, in terms of that, and to do that, to, to do what they thought that was their entitlements. So, and then unfortunately, it's almost the same story over and over and over again. You know, we have our classic, you know, the pilgrims coming and being rescued by the Native Americans and having this wonderful Thanksgiving 
you know, and together to do too. And things seem to be really going great along. But then, of course, if you take the history down years and years and decades, it didn't turn out too well for the Native Americans. Uh, and that story happens over and over and over again. Um, but to really understand the doctrine of discovery, which I said I knew nothing about, when that term came up, I didn't have a clue, you know, what that was and how its effects on the interactions between the Native Americans and Europeans, because again, that became to me, I can't remember. You know, there are certain things that are, that drive, drive people to do it too. And it became embedded, you know, in our psyche um, to do it too, so. But then there'll be a lot of witnessing to the witnesses, Native American siblings, and hopefully that will be very revealing. Um, I find I found out that I, like I said, the more I over I get, the more I realize the less I learn. Um, I'm very ignorant of things, and there are things that are based in me and my upbringing and my culture that are necessarily not intentional, but they're offensive to other cultures. You know, in terms of that, I knew that when I was dealing with some Afro-American people in Los Angeles and I was having lunch with them and I used the word call a spade a spade. And uh, there was a kind of an uncomfortable look from some people. And then afterward, they kind of took me aside. You know what the origin of that term is? And I had no, it's okay, come on. So I don't use that one anymore. Um, so then also, that really strengthened that relationship with different church of the wilderness you know, to do it too. So. That's where you know Pastor Aaron and um, we're, we really want to go back to the congregation and say here's some opportunities, uh, but also have the church council be maybe involved in that too, and then really have Pastor Grant, you know, I guess, give us some histories and also give us some opportunities to respond to that as individuals and respond to that I think as as a congregation, you know, to do it too because. You know, a lot of ways, sometimes people jump into, oh, are you asking us, you know, to give up our land and pay big money back to the Native Americans or whatever group it would be, you know, to do it too. You know, that's not exactly what the LCA is asking us to do, but it's also about that kind of stuff. Okay, anything else? Any questions about that? Again, you'll have a chance at the end to okay, let's move on. The doctrine discovery. This is something that we're going to have to go to every time we're going to be talking about this in a little more detail. But as you can see, there was it all started with a papal bull. I didn't know. I, I thought when it's first starting church history, what a bull was. And I, sometimes I wanted to add a little phrase to the end of that too. A lot of times it's papal bulls where bull blank, something fill in blank. Um, and there's this Latin term for that. And 1493 was Pope, I guess had some connection with Columbus came back and said, hey, you know, I did my journeys and um, I found out there's some more land out there. And I found out there's, you know, he could, and I always talk about Columbus to come to America. Of course, if you, if you know the stories of Columbus, he didn't really come to North America. He was down in the Caribbean and all this kind of stuff he did too. So the Pope said, well, okay, we got some lands over there we didn't know about. We want to make sure that Spain gets the rights to this to do it too. Because Columbus, of course, was you know working for Spain and that kind of stuff to do too. He was Italian. Um, so he's put this line up. He said, there you can read for yourself where we're supposed to be, and everything beyond that line is to Spain. All the territory of possessions, all the trade. And nobody else was allowed to go on that. I guess it would almost be like what we'd call today, which is the no fly zone. The uh, other countries were not supposed to go into that area. The case, Spain would not be in the new world. Well, I mean, the Pope, no, no, most of the people didn't know what they were talking about to do it too. So this is what I meant. That's where that line was. And there's where the Azores and um, came for the are. So anything to the left of that line, on Spain. So you see, that's a lot. <laughs> all North and South America, almost all Greenland, I guess, to that too. So, and that became a challenge for the Europeans to challenge Spain for that. But part of the doctrine of discovery was more than just land because 
Oh, there are people there. Columbus said, oh, we found some you know, interesting people there. And we called them Indians uh, because, of course, mistakenly, he thought he was in the East Indies and he wasn't. So they still called him Indians. And that, this number still goes off to this day. So, so they, Pope says, they can be discovered. So that's where this doctrine of discovery comes. They can be claimed to be exploited by Christian rulers and declare the Catholic faith and Christian religion be exalted everywhere and increase and spread and the health of souls be cared for. And as I put in bold, the barbarous nations to be overthrown and brought to the face itself. And I put a little graphic down below that was oftentimes, you know, to have that out when they came in with the conquistadors and the Spanish came in, they came across these barbarous people, you know, and they, they needed to Christianize them in whatever way it wants, and their methods are not necessarily the most uh, gentle methods, we'll say, you know, if we're doing that. So that's that's the doctrine of discovery. It's all it's all based on that. Papal Bull in 1493, you know, in terms of that. And it set up this huge, you know, competition. Um, so I guess it was kind of like, you know, the neighbors do it. You know, if the Spanish can do it, well, the English can do it. And the Dutch can do it, you know, and the French can do it, and so on and so on and so on. So all the Europeans thought this doctrine of discovery was, you know, the cat's meow for them because they now have the right to get the land, but it, like I said, it became a race. And then, unfortunately, the U.S. picked that up. And you'll see there's a case up there, and we'll go into detail, you can read it for yourself. Um, based on that so that since the europeans can do it and now we're free country we have we picked up the same thing and i translate that off into time our whole country's idea of manifest destiny that we were this was our land and we had the right to and duty almost to, to take over this land so so and of course the american indians their only right was a right of occupancy, which I thought is an interesting term. It means now yeah, they can be on the land; they don't own it. You know, they they can build a house there and they can live there to do too. But at any time, that could be abolished, which you'll see happens quite a bit. Um, so I have another slide. There's a great video animation um, that talks about where it shows the expansion of ownership of the United States lands at sea, and that was the difference between um european culture and in the american culture because the european culture owned things you, know, you had to give your little piece of land you had to have your deed and that kind of stuff native americans have no didn't have that in their psyche about owning things it was like well yeah we we're here and we share things and uh, we don't own things we're just here so when you watch this video which takes just a couple minutes look for first of all when does wisconsin because that's where we're sitting transition from being Native American into state ownership. It becomes a state, if you remember, it, it became a state in 1848. I think that's right, you know, in terms of that. So kind of watch when it transitions from Native American to state ownership. And then we invented this great system called the reservation system. So we decided to move Native Americans the segregated areas, and you'll see their brown areas on the map. And they're, they're, not, they're not there at first. This reservation system was not uh, you know, an initial thing. So, so hopefully it'll work. Oops. And of course, I went too far. So now, sorry, I'm going to have to get out of this for a second and go back. Okay, well, it doesn't, this is when technology is so great. Okay, from current slide. There we go. And I have to wait for the little bar. Okay, it's called The Invasion of America. It's a great video. Hopefully everybody's still seeing it. Here we start, 1783, where we got our constitution.
You'll see there's no reservations yet in the 18, early 1800s. Wisconsin still, still belongs to Native Americans. Oh, now we start losing pieces of it. Now we're a state. And here come the reservations. Notice how Oklahoma, the whole state was a reservation. Uh, that didn't last long though. Because they discover oil. Oh, there goes Oklahoma. Okay, so there's there's today. Um, and then I need to get out of this. I'll have to do it too. So, so that's kind of my um, video, my PowerPoint for that. It's time for just discussion. Now we have you know quite a bit of time now. Reactions and questions. So unmute and go at it. Anybody want to speak to anything you learned? <laughs> and Pastor Grant, did you, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit. Um, has, has this kind of um, knowledge, pretty much common knowledge across the ELCA, or do you think this is something pretty new? Well, I think, um, I mean, I can't speak for the whole, whole of the ELCA. I know that um, just as Americans, uh, we're woefully underinformed with uh, what our own history uh, has been as a country, as far as um, uh, with Native peoples and also with just systemic racism. I think that's something that we're starting to see the the turn around the corner with that. So I'm I'm glad for that, but it's it's been a long road and. Uh, frustrating one uh, because it's hard for people to engage with things that they don't know about and there's a there's a self-interest piece in staying ignorant about things that truly have been done wrong in our name um, uh, but I think we're moving in the right direction as far as starting to actually have a conversation about it now uh, it is stunning to see the um, to see just how things got gobbled up and um, how um, Native peoples kept on getting pushed back and pushed into spots right until um, it was convenient for us to have that spot and then out you go. Um, and that that was a big part of how we built our country. Um, and it's a heck of a way to start off. Curious what other people think and what you're seeing. Yeah, what about the um, our people who are the lamp people? When you went up to Alaska, do that too. Was there any um, things there that you found that were revealing to you? I'll put it that way. Well, we didn't go to Alaska. We went to Northern oh. Ontario. Okay. But right. um, uh, well, I found when we came up there that uh, we weren't quite prepared. This is a entire Native American or community. And the people up there did not trust white people because the only white people that they had interaction with would be like school teachers come in to run the schools. And these people were all being paid big bucks to be there. And so they emphasized, our pilot did it, and actually we worked uh, the first year we were there was with an Anglican church. They, they emphasized to the people there that we were volunteers. We weren't making anything from this. Yeah, we weren't uh, getting paid. They kept He kept stressing to them, they're not getting paid. And I said, why did you say we're not getting paid? And he said, because. He says, you're going to be part of their culture where the teachers and the nurses, and they weren't. They were in a fenced off area and they lived there. And But we didn't, we lived right among them. So were the school 
people there are Canadian. They were Canadian officials. Yeah, they are. They are Canadians, and they got paid big bucks to go up there and teach school for a year, as the nurses did. But, um, but we were accepted into the community because we lived among them. And you had the lamp materials. Were you equipped? You thought the materials were appropriate. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, the first year was there, I found it interesting that he was a uh, the pastor of the church we worked with. He was a lay pastor. He took me out with him to uh, visit the elderly. And in turn, he asked me to, to bless everyone. Well, the thing of it was, a lot of them didn't speak English. They were all uh, Cree. So it uh, a lot of things up there. At that time, I have to remember this is 30 years ago, the Canadian government dealing with the people there, uh, they had a lot of unemployment in their own cities, and they thought it would be better to pay the Native Americans to stay in the reserves, otherwise they'd have them in the city and they'd be paying them welfare. That was kind of a general outlook. So but, by, the, uh, by the, the Army Reserves or... No, no, no. no. The, the, they have reserves. That's the where reservation. Be like reservations. Oh, reservations. They okay. call them res yeah. reserves up there. Okay. So, but yeah, the, where we went up the first year, we were at a place called Big Trout. Uh, it was an island almost, well, it wasn't actually island. It was a narrow isthmus can, that went to the mainland. And uh, the. Uh, so, but it was almost stronger, like by a huge, huge lake. And uh, they, uh, they had, as far as living conditions, they had almost anything you would have down the rest of the country. Only it all had to be brought in on the winter road. Uh, mm -hmm. They were quite isolated. And we were about uh, 400 miles from the end of the last blacktop highway. We were falling in by fault plane. So it made it quite interesting when we wanted to leave. The uh, they called the pilot called us and asked what the lake looked like because if the waves were too big, uh, he wasn't going to come. You didn't just say, "Well, I'm going to town today." You had to depend completely on the weather. So, it uh, the people up there the that we dealt with the Native Americans were very good to us. Uh, they provided all our meals. Uh, they gave us uh, an apartment to live in. Well, it was a house. Right. Yeah. It was a house. So, but uh, it was very worthwhile experience going there, I thought. Uh, they, they one night, they gave us a picnic, and they, they were, had something boiling up hot and everything, and they gave us pork chops, and they paid big bucks for those pork chops. And I said to our pilot, I said, how come we got pork chops and they were eating other stuff? And he said, they were eating moose. And I said, I would have rather had the moose and tried it. But they, they were honoring us, um, giving us something. Well, we raised pigs at the time, so I knew what pork chops were all about. Okay. And just the question, does the lamp program still exist? Yeah. Okay. It was interesting. The when we taught Bible school, uh, here, I'm trying to think how to phrase it. We, the teacher leads the class and explains things, but there, they learn a lot by doing, uh, more of a hands-on approach, uh, completely different than what a structured school like that we have down here. Uh, the second year that we went back was to a different town. We were more uh, psychologically ready to accept that the kids didn't quite behave the way they do here. Uh, they might well, get up and take off and walk out the door and come back in a little later. I mean, but they're that, not naughty, but you know, thing is, well, the first day in church, the first day we went up on a Sunday and the kids were throwing things back and forth and stuff. And I thought, oh my, what did we get into? But did the Native American up there, the people believe that raising them, letting them be, unless they, you know, were going to hurt themselves or hurt somebody. 
it's not such a strict formal thing that we have here. Yeah, it sounds like our confirmation classes, right? right. <laughs> Pastor Aaron, oh, Pastor Aaron, oh, she's still honoring. My sixth graders yeah. only run around before class. They yeah. don't usually run around in class, but sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you for sharing for sharing that. I think that's a wonderful insight into what was going on in Canada. And there's a church program, and it's not connected with any particular domination, is it? No, well, uh, it was Anglican where we were, but they have different churches up there. And Pastor Grant, are you uh, familiar with the LAMP program? A little bit. Um, I had known a couple of people that uh, worked with LAMP, but I've never worked with LAMP directly. Okay. Yeah, I just, like I said, our school supported that. We had one time we had some speakers come in and we gave money to the LAMP program to do it too. So are you aware, Pastor Grant, of any other parallel kinds of programs where the ELCA does things where it reaches out to Native Americans? Uh, LAMP is the only one that I'm aware of. That doesn't mean that there aren't more. I haven't haven't researched that too deeply. So, um, okay. but I saw that Anita had something there. Yep. I wanted to ask a question. Are, were, the, were there any Native schools or in Canada, just like here, were all the Native children forced to go to our public schools? Well, where we were, there was a school right on the reservation, and um, all the kids went to it. They had Canadian teachers come in and teach them, but non, it was a native. But it was all native because everybody living up there was Native American except a few people. That's why we were saying before they, their perspective of white people which we consider our, at that time with they're all there to make money off of them. The government was paying, you know, to keep them happy to be up there and stay where they were on the reserve. There was uh, amongst the population, there was uh, a lot of, uh, at that time, I should say, not just drug use, but alcoholism because the people were bored. They had the technology of what goes on like here, but it wasn't, they weren't subsistence living anymore. They didn't depend on fishing and trapping and whatever. It was a big changeover in their whole mm -hmm. dynamics of how the people lived. Yeah, and I think that goes back to, you know, I'll get into that more next week um, to how we try to look at their culture as being, you know, barbaric. And they needed, we needed to change their religion, their spirituality and their culture. You know, also too to to be better, I guess. You know, to put it that way, that was kind of our duty as Christian people. You know, you know, to do that. Um, so, Nancy, I see you're still on. Pete, I don't see Pete on anymore. Did yeah, he? And I'm wondering, um, Hugh, if we're moving into the kind of discussion portion of our time together, if you want to yeah, stop yeah. sharing your screen, so then we can kind of see <laughs> oh, everyone okay. at once, if that would be okay. Yeah. Yeah, Thanks. I had I had a question. Because uh, I know there's a few ed retired educators in the group here. Is there is a doctor of discovery in the curriculum at all? Which curriculum? Um, our curriculum here in well in Wisconsin. Wasn't in my week of Fremont. It wasn't. No, I would I would think that. I mean, like I, I know, hopefully I'm not just saying that I should know more as an educator, but I I had never heard of it. It was never in any of the historical, it wasn't in any of my history classes. You know, we talked about Manifest Destiny, but I, it wasn't in any of my, you know, teaching materials, anything like that. So, um, yeah, was, as, as kind of, someone who probably was in the classroom as a student more recently than anyone else currently on this Zoom, um, we didn't talk about, maybe it's because I went to a Catholic school, but we did not talk about the Doctrine of Discovery at all. Um, I don't think I learned about it until after the 2016 Churchwide Assembly resolution um, condemning the, the Doctrine of Discovery. Manifest Destiny was definitely talked a lot about, especially in AP U.S. history. That I do remember. <laughs> okay. Um, it's kind of a large historical uh, thing that probably should be taught. <laughs> well, I'm sure there would be a lot of pushback to putting it into the schools now, you know, with the parallel things that are going on. You know, right now too, and I think that's where, to me, I think the church has an opportunity. Maybe I don't know Pastor Grant can shake his head, maybe to do that too, to do some things that you can't do in public education, 
you know, to do too, because there's two, two sides of that, because first of all, we have to recognize that the church has not been the shining example of how to do this, you know, in the past, but we have an opportunity to change that. I mean, that's part of our call as Christians to, you know, as, and share the gospel and, but not just share it in words, but share it in deeds. So Pastor Grant, what do you, what do you respond to that? Do you think the church has a better opportunity than public education? Well, I, I think the church has an opportunity. I think the schools have an opportunity. Um, I think we're, we're um, called to be salt and light. And that uh, doesn't just mean um, uh, being as the church. That means being sent out into the world and, um, and doing our best wherever we are as uh, followers of Jesus to uh, proclaim the gospel in word and deed, which means to um, stand up for the truth wherever the, wherever the truth is hard and also for the love of God that's there for all of us in the midst of hard truths. Um, and then also working towards making things better. Uh, that's what our, our theology uh, pushes us towards. That's what the uh, the gospel ultimately gives us freedom to do. We have we talk about the freedom of a Christian, and um, at the center of that is that we are we are freed, we are loved in Jesus Christ. Uh, to then stop justifying ourselves and start looking at the mess that's all around us, the mess that we've been a part of, the mess that we still are a part of, and to say how can we do better uh, for for our neighbors' uh, sake, for for our sake, and for God's name's sake in the world. So yes, I think the church has a definite place. I think the schools have a definite place. I think all of us have a definite place. In, okay. in this narrative. In, can I, I ask, because my children did not go to school in Wisconsin. We were living in Iowa. Do, is it not a requirement in Wisconsin schools that there at least some, ch some time of the year that native cultures are talked <laughs> about? It's required. Yeah, um, it's part so, that is, yes. But when we, hi, when we vote for school board members or ask um, for school board members, what do you think about not talking about race theories? What do you think? Um, what's your position on these? It should not just include our black culture, but it should include our brown cultures too. And I think we can ask those questions. Where do you stand on this? Or, and I could say, oh, I never even, you know, just like all of us are learning today. They might say, I don't know, but I will look into it. Or they'll say, I could care less. You know, so we need to ask those questions. Okay. What, and for Pastor Aaron and, and Nancy as congregational members and Pete, you know, in terms of that, what would you hope that Trinity could do? Well, take it, Pete. <laughs> <laughs> Remember, this is being recorded, so you know. Yeah. It's not anything that you have to do, but just it would be, be sometimes it's just kind of time to dream a little bit. Well, I think as uh, the more we educate ourselves, the more we will be able to go out and, and share this. And this isn't theory. This is what happened. And mm -hmm. to just be able to state the facts the way they are, and help others to see, oh, there's more we need to learn. And in that way, we can be leaders to the greater community. Yeah, I think for me, it's, it's really an eye opener to realize that the coupling of kind of the manifest destiny with the proselytization of Christianity, that the doctrine of discovery was a pope and church um, part of it really, you know, ends up um, putting the role of the church in in there in terms of a a proper um, sort of promulgation of of the gospel and and kind of like pastor grant was going over in terms of what is our calling and and duty i think i think it's something that you know as as nancy said just to to realize and and get the history and it's 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 at, for me right now it's like drinking from a fire hose to to think oh my gosh i, I didn't realize the church played a role in this and and had the had the doctrine of discovery be part of um, the justification of, of what we've done. 
I could go back to Matt. I think Matt is the one that's in the conference room. Matt, what is your thoughts on all this? You've had a chance to just listen for a while. Let me go unmute him. It looks like okay. he's having trouble. Yeah, go ahead. Go unmute him. We'll give him a chance. And poor guy, he can't, he to, he can't do it himself. Yeah, we're, we're closing down to the last five minutes to do that, to do two. So um, is there anything in this, uh, how should I put it, system or this presentation system that you would you like us particularly, or you would maybe change or expand or whatever? Well, I, I knew nothing of Doctrine of Discovery, so I too, I, I'm, I'm kind of shocked that uh, um, how that all worked out. Um, as far as just an you know, oversight of everything that we've discussed, and I don't know if I'm alone in this, but, um, and maybe it was part of my upbringing, but I live with this constant feeling of guilt as to what we've done to the native people. Mm -hmm. um, and I, and I just, I, I forever uh, experienced that. And I know when I was up there to bowler, I, I was up there apologizing and, and, and I know that they weren't, they weren't saying, well, you know, you ought to, but um, that's certainly how I feel. And I, and I, I guess I have a hard time. I feel the same way about the, the black community. Um, I, I feel like I carry the, some guilt for what's been done. Yeah, and I think that's that's the difficult balance you have here too, because we don't want to be driven by guilt. You know, we all experience that to do too. I think we need to be saying this. Okay, we can't make up for the sins of the past, especially for you know my parents, my grandparents, and all that to do. But what can we do now? Learning what happened in the past to make kind of positive things in the future. That's my whole, one of my main goals of this to do too is, yeah, okay. Yeah, we can express, and Matt, I appreciate your saying, talking about the guilt, because I think that's a common thing that I ran into every time I would go to something like this, I would just say, I didn't understand this. I feel bad about this. And, and I think as was talking about the, uh, our friends who went to the lamp, it, the Native Americans don't necessarily hold it against us individually. Uh, they kind of hold it as kind of a, okay, this happened because I think of uh, the way the structures were set up and the way the government was set up and the way the schools were set up and so on. So, so. Yeah, I Alan think, Corey, um, who is a Methodist pastor in apartheid South Africa, um, talks a lot about how we set up our systems to do our sinning for us, um, right? And a lot of the residential schools, not all of them, but I think a majority of them that we've heard such horrible things from a lot of them were run by churches, by mm -hmm. denominations, um, and it's right. And so as we're, one thing that I'm really excited about um, is that we're in a posture of learning from our Native American siblings, right? That we're not going to like, all right, we're going to come in and this is what we're going to do and this is how we're going to fix it, right? We're, I think it's really important that we have a posture of like listening and learning instead of this kind of overbearing um, right. aspect that so often the church has been guilty of in the past. Yeah. Yep, and that's exactly right. And that's my whole posture on this. It's too, is that we just need to do a lot of listening to it. So, so we're down to two minutes. So, Pastor, do you want to, um, I don't know, well, did anybody else have any suggestions for the future? For the way, I, way, way this is set up? I'd love to just uh, reinforce what Pastor Aaron was saying as far as that, that um, this is, difficult work because we've set up our systems um, in such a way that we don't need to directly in, encounter the sin that works on our behalf. Right. Um, and staying in the conversation is critical uh, because yeah. that's, there's a lot of work to do and um, keeping our eyes on the, on the goal of right. is best. Yeah. I don't want to dwell on the past so too much. So, Pastor Aaron, uh, one minute to go. Can you close us off with prayer? Is that how this, do we have to yeah. keep it right right to noon? Okay. I, you know, we try to respect people's time if we can. Okay. <laughs> so the Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Loving and gracious God, uh, we thank you that your mercy is new every morning. Uh, we thank you for this chance to learn um, and to discover more um, about our shared history. Uh, we ask that your spirit of wisdom be with us as we continue to chew on all the information uh, that we have received today and that you guide us in the best way uh, to learn and to live uh, with our Native American siblings. 
We love you and we pray all of this in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Okay. So be evangelists, spread the word about this.